Life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to our episode where we talk about books. Lots and lots of books. There's many words that is going to be said about many words. <laughs> I have no response to that. <laughs> so in this episode of Elated Geek, we are talking about all the books that we read for the month of February. Normally, we would also talk about the February Owl Crate, but I haven't received it yet because they had a delay in one of the items in the box. So we'll just post that on my Instagram so you can see that later. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, we're going to talk about all the books, all the books that we read. And, you know, February was a really good start for the books for me. I don't know about what you feel. I, I think I did okay. I, yeah. I, I mean, I went through two different trilogies in one month. Yes, you did. Way to, way to go there. Mm -hmm. I, I bet you feel accomplished. So we're going to talk about books that I may have read in the past that Marshall read this month, and I am going to be talking about all the books that I have read this month that I don't think you've read any of. I doubt No, it. I don't think you've read any of them. I doubt it, yeah. <laughs> so, before we really get into everything, what you drinking? Same thing you are. Oh, you know. Because I got it for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the chocolate chip caramel... Um, it, it's the it's a frozen drink, is what they Frozen cappuccino yeah. From drink. Wawa. Yeah. So it's it's got caramel, it's got blended pieces of chocolate in there, and then it's got chocolate chips on top. Yes, it is very dairy. <laughs> very dairy, yes. Um, I, it was kind of getting stuck on in my throat as mm. I was trying to drink it, but it is delicious and far too much sugar. Yes. I'm going to regret that later. Mm -hmm. We're going to be crashing later on. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Got some movies lined up, going to do it. Okay. Do we want to start with stats? Yeah, let's go ahead and start. So I have gotten a total of 11 books. Impressive. Yeah, and that's going to have four five stars and seven four stars. Okay, so you you did some some really high star books this month. I did enjoy some some of these books that I did. And we'll, we'll kind of get into it because some of them, like especially the ones in the series, I liked some of them more than others. Right. But generally, there was nothing here that I was like, heck no. Now, there was one DNF. So this month I read a 17 books total, which I usually plan for about 16 because that's how much it, it fits on the page that I used to track it. But I did go 17 this month, which is awesome. I had three five stars. Nine four stars, two three and a half stars, which I will explain why later, three three stars, and I DNF'd nine books. And, you know, I have a higher DNF rate mostly because I do a lot of review books. And if a book doesn't catch me, then I just, I don't waste my time. I just get rid of it. So, yeah, I don't try to push myself to finish the book because I have so many that people send me for review. I just can't. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's... That's basically what I did this month, 17. Okay. And in mine, I have five audiobooks, three ebooks, and three comic books. I had three audiobooks, 12 ebooks, and two physical books. Out of those, also, um, one of them was a science fiction. Three of them were thrillers, although two of them were comic book thrillers. And then seven of them were fantasies. <laughs> We know where you kind of landed this. <laughs> that was how I was last yeah, month. Yeah, but I mean, again, two trilogies. So that kind of yeah. forces you down a certain path. Right. And that brings me to a total of 3,764 pages. Awesome. Okay. I had 13 new adult books and four young adult books. I kind of wanted to throw that in because of the range of books that I had read this month. Of those, five of them were like thriller books. Five of them were fantasy slash sci-fi slash dystopian books. Four of them were romance or contemporary romance. Two of them were nonfiction. And one of them is a category I never thought that I would read much of or enjoy. 
but that is historical fiction. I had one book. Historical fiction is usually not my fave at all. But I will be talking more about that when we dive into the books. Mm. Total number of pages for this month is 6,162. And so, with our leveling system, I am a level 14 and you are level 17. Correct. All right, so now we're going to talk about the books we actually did read, uh, starting from our three stars and working our way up. So we'll bounce back and forth, depending on how many stars we actually had. So for me, I had three three-star reads. The The first book I'm going to talk about was a young adult book. It's called Firstborn Academy, Shadow Reaper by Isla Frost. You may have remembered that I read Firstborn Academy, I believe in January. It might have been December. The first book in the trilogy, and I liked it, so I decided to read the other two before my Kindle Unlimited subscription expired. Uh, and I did, and so this was the third one in the series, and it was just okay. It wrapped up, but it was just okay. You know, it was it was just a fine read. I don't think I need to talk about it more. The other two books I read are thriller books, both of which, well, one of them came out in December, and the other one is coming out either in March or April. So I don't know. These two thriller books just didn't really jive with me as much as I hoped they would. They were in my most anticipated list, and I think that's why... I rated them a little lower than maybe I would have had I not been expecting it. So the first one is The Wrong Family by Taryn Fisher. Taryn Fisher also wrote Rives, which I read last year. It is the story of a woman who is living with this family and and not the way that you expect. And it goes from the past to the present talking about what this family may have done wrong. Mm -hmm. in the past and how this woman discovers the secrets of this family and it was fine it was a little creepy at the end which was great but I I did appreciate the storytelling aspect of it how it goes back and forth from past to present and gives you little nuggets of information to make you think one thing and then it completely like derails you to another direction and I very much appreciated that but there were just a lot of points in it that I was like okay that's fine (laughs) I'm a little bit bored. And then we have Every Last Fear by Alex Finlay. Every Last Fear is the story. It kind of even opens up with the sentence, their bodies were found on a Tuesday. And this story talks about this family that was found dead. It's like the mom, the dad, and the two younger siblings were found dead in this cabin in Mexico, like an Airbnb type place. And they have two other sons one of which is in jail for suspected of killing his girlfriend, and the other one is in college. They are trying to figure out what happened to their family and why. The story is told from the points of view of the brother that's in college, the father, the sister, and an FBI agent. The story itself was semi-interesting. I guess the ending, like a mile away. But my biggest problem with this book is that after doing some research, I found out a couple things I can't totally substantiate, substantiate, but I will tell you, going to kind of find out, even if it is a rumor. So the rumor is that Alex Finley is really AJ Finn, who wrote The Woman in the Window. And if you do any kind of research on AJ Finn, you will find out that people believe he is a con artist. For many different reasons. On top of which, this book, I have an issue with how this book portrays Hispanic Americans or Hispanic people in general. It's not in a very positive light. All of them in the book are not in a positive light. I don't, I kind of like took offense to, not offense to me personally, but offense, I was offended for them, that none of the Hispanic people in this book were written positively. And so as because of that, I knocked it way down because I did finish it, but I did not appreciate that at all. So that's one of the reasons why I knocked it so far down. And because Marshall didn't have any three stars, I'm going to give you my 3.5 stars. My first is Take a Hit in Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the second book out uh, before, I think it's like... Get a Life, Chloe Brown. Get a Life, Chloe Brown. Of course, I can't remember that book either. Yes. Get a Life, Chloe Brown, which I loved. And this is the second book. And I liked this book. It is very spicy. 
<laughs> very, very spicy. But it was a good book. It wasn't the best book that I read, and it really wasn't my favorite. I really like Chloe Brown better, but this one wasn't bad. It's about a girl. She's like a professor, but also a, a student. And she falls in love kind of with this security guard that's outside. And as you can tell from me saying this, I don't remember that much about it. I did read it while we were on vacation, though. It's kind of like the flipped opposite. Like, most of the romance novels you read, the man doesn't believe in the relationship and the woman wants one. In this one, it's kind of flipped. She doesn't believe in long-term relationships because she sees everything around her, like, basically falling down. She just wants, like, you know, a casual sexual relationship. And he does not believe that. So they're kind of caught between the two. It was entertaining. That's why it's almost a four star, but it wasn't the best. And the last 3.5 star I have is Her Dark Lies by Judge J.T. Ellison. The last J.T. Ellison book I read was called Good Girls Lie, but there is no connection between the two. Her Dark Lies reminds me so much of the guest list, but not really, because they all go to this island where they're going to be having a wedding. The island is owned by the family of the groom. So this island is super creepy. There's like grottos and cemeteries and crypts and everything. I think it's like in Italy, but kind of not in Italy also. You don't know a lot about this family at first. They're very mysterious in what they actually do. And then people end up dying. As a mystery, I thought this was really interesting, but... The story is told between the main character and also the dead wife of the guy that the character is marrying in this book. You know she's dead. They tell you she's dead. She tells you she's dead. Mm -hmm. So you read the whole book knowing that she's dead Mm -hmm. as a third person omniscient watcher of what is going on for more insight. Which was a very clever, clever way of writing this book. But I think my biggest problem with it was really the ending and how it kind of wound up. As a thriller, it was great. And I still really do enjoy J.T. Ellison's writing because I really enjoyed the write of this book. But I just felt like the ending was a little off, Mm -hmm. I think. All right. So let's go on to four star books. I have got seven four star books. All right. My only issue is that many of them are wrapped up in the series, and so, it's best to talk about them as a series. For sure. All right, let's do that. So, one of them that I did do was Southern Bastards. That was the comic books. You will find more information about these in the Spinner Iraq Kids that Corey and I did very recently. And in that, it's basically the story of this guy who goes back to his hometown after a long period of time. Finds that it's been corrupted by violence and darkness, and he's going to lay a whooping on some people. Eh, it was not bad. It was very gritty. It was, it was very dark, but it did so with a purpose. Was the actual illustration dark, or was it yes. like in color? It, it was... It, it was very monochromatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, the color scheme was kind of muted, but it then used little hints of other colors in there just to make things really pop out. Right. I'd kind of liken it, although you've never read them, to Hellboy and Sin City. Those comic books have very monochromatic, very stark, gritty styles. Then I also read, and this is actually the first book that I did this month, it was The Wife Upstairs. This is the story of a woman who is a, and I believe this was actually a reversioning, re-envisioning of Jane Eyre. That is correct. That is what yeah. I heard. Mm-hmm. So there's this woman who's a dog walker in a really rich neighborhood, and she falls in love with a guy who's so perfect and rich. Mm-hmm. And then she finds out that things may not necessarily be as good as she thought it was. And that's okay, because she's not as good as she likes him to think she is. Correct. Uh, One of the things that I did really like about this book is that I didn't like any of the characters, but it didn't actually matter. Yeah, it really doesn't. I I, I was exactly the same way. I'm like, none of these people are redemptive at all. And yet, because of what happens, and because there is people that are more odious than them... (laughs) <laughs> um, you find yourself being okay with it. Yeah, I really like how Marshall describes some of the books after I've already read them because I feel like you pin the nail 
on the head. Yeah. Pretty well. Fun fact, I have heard rumor that they are coming out with a Wife Upstairs 2. I am not sure how that's working, considering the ending of this book, but it could. The Wife Upstairs, the second floor. (laughs) Basement. (laughs) I also very recently finished Fable by Adrian Young. And this was a really interesting series. It's it's classified, I would still classify it as fantasy, mm-hmm. but in how it ran its fantasy, it was very homey, very down-to-earth kind it of thing. It really was. It was not high fantasy at all, which is what I really liked about it. It was my favorite book in January that I read. Mm-hmm. And like, it's the story of this girl who is a dredger. She's basically somebody who goes down underwater looking for hidden treasure, looking for gemstones and gold that is under the water. And one of the biggest things about her is that, A, her father is the captain or owner of a large fleet of trading vessels mm-hmm. and is very wealthy, and he just abandoned her. Yeah, yeah. For reasons we get into. For reasons. Mm. Although you think he's like this horrible father, but for reasons. But her mother also has contributed to one of her greatest abilities. That is that she is what's called a gem sage. And she can feel these vibrations in gems and kind of know what kind of a gem they are, Mm -hmm. what their quality is. Mm -hmm. And this is dangerous. What did you think about the characters and your connection to the characters in this book? I honestly, even though we spent a lot of time with the crew of the Marigold, this is the ship that helps her along most of the journey, we spent a good time with them, but I didn't feel connected to them. Mm Mm-hmm. I felt like I should feel connected to them, especially given just how deep their connections to each other. They were a crew and they they were bonded and it felt like I should be connected to them too, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that was was the reason why I gave it a four star rather than a five star. Oh, gotcha. I really liked Fable herself Mm -hmm. and I liked the story of her, her father, and her mother. And I oddly got the father's thought process Mm -hmm. a lot better than I thought I would. But I just didn't get the Marigold crew very well. And that's kind of odd to me. I think the reason why I was okay with it was because I felt such a connection to Fable herself. Mm -hmm. So that's why I gave it a higher rating. So yeah, I, I would say I agree with you though. It was hard for me to connect with certain people on the Marigold. But you know, other than that, the writing is fantastic, mm-hmm. and you're going to be reading Namesake in March, right? Correct. Yeah, especially because it's it's for our book club. But I would have read it anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then from there on in, my four stars are kind of put in with the series. Mm-hmm. So I did two trilogies. One is the Curse Breaker series by Bridget Kemmerer. And the other one is the Caraval series. By Stephanie Garber. Thank you. Thank you. These are two fantasy series that I really did enjoy. I gave them variously five stars and four stars throughout. The Curse Breaker series is the story kind of like a modern version of Beauty and the Beast, where a modern girl is sucked into a fantasy world that the prince is cursed to turn into a monster every so often. And she has cerebral palsy. And she has cerebral palsy, which does give her... It makes it seem like it's a problem for her, but because of it, she is so strong in her personality. She has a lot of internal strength to keep on doing things Even when everyone else would be like, oh, let somebody else do this for me. She has a big heart for other people. And I really liked her character. I actually really enjoyed all the characters in this series. But this is the reason why two of the books, A Curse So Dark and Lonely and A Vow So Bold and Deadly, only got four stars rather than five stars. Ren is not consistently portrayed. Throughout the series, everybody is telling us that he's this great tactical person. He's a very intelligent person. When really he's a very deeply emotional person. And he very easily just lets all tactics fly to the side and does whatever he feels like. And that was a, a bit of an issue for me in the first book. Once I came to understand, okay, this is what he really is like... I was okay with it. Mm-hmm. With A Vassal Bold and Deadly, however, 
My issue was not in any of the first part of the book. I understand that other people felt like it was kind of a slow lead up. Yeah, I did. I, I did not feel like that. My problem was that the ending, which was very satisfying for most characters, two particular characters are just kind of like, poof, there you go. You yeah. kind of have an ending, but not really. That's exactly what I thought. Yeah, it's that we have a direction that their ending is going, but no clear resolution. So you're saying that the second book, which was... A Heart So Fierce and Broken, fierce and broken. was excellent i love that book it's so good it was very good i love liamara mm -hmm. as a character i really enjoyed gray as a character and just everything did come together in this right. book i'm going to also say that this is very much like a court of thorns and roses however it is not as steamy yeah. So if you are looking to have a very strong female-centered story that's kind of got this Beauty and the Beast feel, but you've got a teenager and you don't necessarily want to see them seeing a whole bunch of, mm, give them this. There are sex scenes in these books. We're not saying that there aren't, but they are not graphic. They're not like yeah. Akatar is at all. And I mean, Akatar, like the first book, it was like, okay, it happened once or twice. But then from the second book on, it's like, Boinking up and down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Caraval. Caraval. It's been a very long time since I have read this trilogy. And honestly, I, it took me forever to read the third one for some reason. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts about this. Okay. So the Caraval series takes place in a fantasy world. Uh, one of the main facets that we do see here is this Caraval itself. And it used to be a group of traveling players, but now they stay in one spot. And they are actors with magic. The The way that they get this magic, it kind of harkens back to old legends. And that's a main part of the story because everything here, the legends, Caraval, the main characters, they're all kind of connected in this huge story arc that I didn't really know I was getting into. Yeah, it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland meets Labyrinth meets Now You See Me, Now You Don't. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty accurate there. There is one thing that I thought was really interesting. Now, when I was first going through Caraval, there's this affectation to the main character in that she relates all emotions to colors. Hmm. And at first, you just think that this is a way that the, the writer is writing the character. But it's actually a major plot point in book three. And... That doesn't really spoil a huge amount for you because I'm right. not going to tell you why it's related. But it's right. a huge part of the story. So basically in book one, she's trying to find her sister as part of the game. In book two... Her sister is trying to find the master of Caraval, Legend. But at the same time, in order to do that, she needs to get this deck of destiny. Basically a, a group of tarot cards that actually has magic to it. Right. And then in the third book, it kind of all is wrapped up. In a fight against evil gods, effectively. Right, basically, yes. Yeah. And I really like these first two books because of this whole game aspect mm -hmm. and the, the truth versus reality. However, when we get into the third book, a lot of that is dropped for this big, huge conflict. Mm-hmm. A lot of the truth versus reality is also dropped. Like, all the mainstays of the series is dropped just to finish the story. Yeah. And the thing that I dislike the most is that Donatella, the sister of the main character from the first book, who is a major character in this book, is just so wishy-washy. Yeah, she really isn't that great. What I did think was interesting, now that I'm remembering it, is that there is a major plot point, and I think it starts somewhere around the second book, that has to do with a person in these two girls' lives that you didn't really expect to show mm -hmm. up, and you learn more about yeah. her, and you're like, wow, this is this Yeah, is a this, this crazy. character gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the story goes on. Right. Until you get to the end, it's like, this character was everything. Yeah, exactly. When you when you start the book one, you don't even think about this character at all. Yeah. But yeah. So cool. And how did you rate the, the three different books? So I rated Caraval book one and two, book two being legendary. Um, I rated those as five stars. Mm -hmm. And Finale, I rated as four stars. I've got one or two other books on my list here, but 
Let's talk about your four stars. But first, I'm going to talk about some nonfiction books that I read. I did read two. And last year, I didn't really count these type of books in my lineup. But I thought, you know what? Why not? I'm reading them. Mm. Might as well read. Might as well count, right? Yeah. So the first book I read is called Ancient Remedies. It's by Dr. Josh Axe. And I really got this from NetGalley as a review, but I was interested in it because it has a lot of like Chinese herbal medicine in it, how to use herbs and homeopathy, etc. And I have been really interested in that lately. And I think this book was great because it actually has in it a list of like, are these your symptoms? Try these different herbs. So I have acquired some different vitamins and herbs to use in my everyday life. So that's cool. The second nonfiction book that I read, his name is Anthony Porosky. He wrote it with Mindy Fox. Anthony is one of the new Queer Eyes. He's the one who does the cooking. It is Anthony's second book, Anthony, Let's Do Dinner. And because he has a Polish background, there are some Polish recipes in here. But overall, the way he breaks it down is pretty fun. So he's got like snacks and he's got, you know, veggies and he's got meat. You know, he breaks it down like that. But then he also breaks it down by like comfort food. The pictures are gorgeous and the recipes are very well, like easy to understand. So I definitely gave those four stars. I did also read the second book in the Firstborn Academy series, which is Shadow Witch. I gave it four stars. I liked it a little bit better than the third book. Mm-hmm. But um, this girl, she gets recruited and has to go to this academy where she becomes, I think, what's called like a walker, but it's not like a zombie thing or anything. And uh, she develops a power, but her power is one of those powers that could conceivably end the world. So it's it's very like... It's fine. (laughs) It's a fine book. It's fantasies or whatever. I read another book by Melanie Summers this month. I I try to read one every month. And this one is called Whisk Away. It's the second one in the Paradise Bay series. I'm going to be reading the third one, which is The Sweet Life. And it's spelled sweet like a hotel suite. And it takes place on this Paradise Bay island in the Caribbean. And the owners, which we met in the first book, they decide that they're going to take an island and make it like a private island and charge people like $15,000 a night to stay there. They get a private chef and they get like, I think, two people that go and clean. So the owner's sister just finished culinary school and she comes back to the resort and she's like, you're going to give me a spot in one of your restaurants and everything's going to be awesome. And she ends up having to be at the private island working and cooking in a houseboat And she's, like, really bitter about it because she's like, I'm supposed to be in a full kitchen and now I'm in this, like, dinky little houseboat trying to cook five-star meals for these VIP people. But the guy that she's cooking for is an author and he's been trying to write his last book of the series and hasn't been able to. So he goes to this island to clear his head and write the book. And, you know, it's a romantic comedy, so it goes from there. (laughs) sure you can understand where it goes yeah yes but i i really love i actually had read this book before before i read the first one like a couple of years ago which is really what turned me on to melanie summers and why i love her so much as a writer so i'm, I'm glad that i can read the third one and how to wrap up the series there I read a book called Cinder by Marissa Meyer. Uh, Marshall is familiar with Marissa Meyer mm-hmm. because she also wrote Renegades. And Cinder is a book that I tried to read years ago and for some reason could not. I don't know why. It is a post-apocalyptic but also Asian take on Cinderella where Cinder, the main character, is a cyborg, kind of. She's also a mechanic the king is about to have a ball that he has every year to celebrate like this war or something that they have, but his closest enemies are called Lunars and they're from the moon. I know even in speaking about this book, it sounds funky. It sounds a little bit like far-fetched. It, it sounds like somebody yanked all the tropes out of the 80s. But no, it's not. I, I gave it four stars. Obviously it was mm-hmm. good. What I did not like about this book, which is both a pro and a con if you think about it, the book, even though it was like three-ish hundred pages, ended in a spot that I was like, wait, what? That, what? What? what, do you, what this is it? What? No. 
bad for me, good for the author, because now you have to read her next book mm. in order to... <laughs> so she left you with it. a really good cliffhanger. I would say it's a really a random cliffhanger. Gotcha. I wouldn't say it's necessarily great. I, it's just one of those which are like, wait, where'd the rest of the book go? <laughs> it somebody... seems like a strange place to end it. I want to know where the puppy and the penguin <laughs> went at the end of this book. What? <laughs> what is their fate? <laughs> Elf reference. Mm-hmm. Excellent. But great, and I and I can't read to read more. I don't know when I'm going to, though, but because I already had this book and it fulfilled a prompt, I decided to read it. Mm. So let me ask you, what was it that was Cinderella-esque from this cyborg post-apocalyptic sci-fi? She was adopted, quote-unquote, by her father, who then died, and so she lives with her stepmother and two other daughters there is a king she has to go to a ball okay she does lose something in the vicinity of her foot area okay it's good. not a shoe but it's something else see this is why you make sure that all of your cybernetics are properly screwed on correct yes okay but there's a reason why okay okay, okay. so so i get you i get you okay yeah next i would like to talk about a new author to me but not to the rest of the world. I do not know why I am so late picking up this author. I read Taylor Jenkins' read, y'all. So sorry I was not on this bandwagon before. But although this is the the first time I have read this author this month, this is not the first Taylor Jenkins' read book I have read this month, which I will be talking about in my five-star reads. So this book is called Maybe in Another Life, and it is uh, it was one of the books that our book club was reading this month. And after I had read another book by her, I was like immediately, yes, reading this. And Maybe in Another Life reminds me so much of Sliding Doors. Do you remember that movie, Sliding Doors? No. Okay, so the movie Sliding Doors is Gwyneth Paltrow, and she, something happens. She, like, loses her job or something, so she has to go home from work early, and she goes to catch her train to go home, and in one, she catches the train, and the other one, she doesn't catch the train, and her life splits off. Mm -hmm. And you see the two storylines about the consequences of what happens, whether she caught the train or not. In one storyline, she keeps her hair long, and the other one, she keeps her hair short, so you can easily keep track of which timeline you're in. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting story, especially in the end, how it kind of comes back together. Does it, does the same ending happen? depending on her storyline, or is it different, okay? So this is kind of the same thing. So in one, it, it's about this girl, who she breaks up with her quote-unquote boyfriend, who she just found out was married. So she's getting away from him, she's going to go live on her friend's couch. In one storyline, she is fine. She leaves this restaurant, everything's fine. And in the other storyline, she gets hit by a car and is landed in the hospital. In both storylines, similar things happen, but in both storylines, she has the same characters around her, kind of. I really thought, because I'm listening to this in the audiobook, it is going to be horrendous for me to figure out which timeline I'm in, in which time, while I'm listening to this, because I don't have that visual cue like I did in Sliding Doors. What, what, where is her yeah. hair, you know? I did not have that issue. There were a couple times where I had to be like, Okay, she's talking about this. That means she's in this timeline. But I didn't have it. And I just thought that the story was so interesting. And it ended so differently from Sliding Doors that there was like a completely fresh take on how different timelines could end up. And you could still be happy with your life. Mm -hmm. That, I'm interested in reading this. Okay, I got it from the library. It seems like... It seems like a good one to kind of learn how to keep different timelines straight. Yeah, for If you're sure. ever interested in writing things like a Groundhog Day. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, I probably would recommend, yeah. It, seemed, it, it was seems very really good. good. All right, so now that we're done with those ones, let's talk about some thriller slash horror books. I have three of those in my four-star reads. The first one is Mother May I by Jocelyn Stewart. It comes out soon as I did review it for NetGalley, and it was an audiobook. And it is a story of a woman whose son gets kidnapped. And she gets letters and phone calls from the lady who kidnaps her son, says, I'm taking care of your son, but I need you to do this first. Then you'll get him back. 
And the thing that she wants her to do is not great. Uh-huh. It's not a good thing. It's not a, not a good thing at all. But how far will she go to get her son back? And as the story unwinds and as you start to realize why this woman kidnapped this lady's son, woo, this is a tangled web. Tangle, tangle web. I have never read anything by Jocelyn Jackson either, but I really liked this book. I thought it was very interesting. There were a couple things at the end that I was like, oh, you know what? I'm not sure about this. But overall, the story and how it was presented and how you find out these nuggets of information, at some point, I was so stressed out for what was happening in the book. Like, very much so. I totally recommend if you like that kind of, like, real nail-biter, what is going to happen, oh no, is she going to do this, what's going to happen type things. It's it's very interesting. And, and you'd say there's a lot of, like, hidden things along the way, like, clues that you might have missed along the way? Uh, I don't know if there's so much as clues, but there are, like, she'll tell you, for example, in general terms, this happened to my daughter, etc. And then you'll find, you'll have an idea in your head, oh, this is what happened to her daughter. But then you'll kind of go later on and you'll be like, oh, this is what happened to her daughter type thing, you know? You are free to make assumptions based on what she says that are not necessarily truth. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. That does sound like a really interesting book, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of gives me vibes, kind of like The Other People by C.J. Tudor. Mm. But this sounds a lot better. Yeah, it, it is opinion. a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The next book I have is one that I have uh, recommended to Marshall to read. And it is, he started it by Samantha Downing. I read My Lovely Wife. I believe it was December or January. And I really like the way that this writer writes. I'm not exactly always sold with the endings, but I am sold with the journey and the experience of how things happen. In this book, the main character is in a car with her brother and sister, right? Yeah, brother, sister, her sister-in-law and her husband are all in a car following a road trip that was done with her grandfather years ago. I want to say it was at least 10 years ago, maybe more. He has died, and in order for them to get their inheritance, they must do the exact same trip and not deviate from the trip. If they deviate, they don't get the money. If anyone gets put in jail, they don't get the money. There are a lot of secrets from the first trip. Especially secrets that the other two people with them do not know. Technically, those other two people should not be with them. But that's neither here nor there. What really is fun about this book, though, is they make a lot of, like, historical stops. So, like, for example, they stop at the Bonnie and Clyde Museum in one of the states. I think it's in Georgia. I can't remember where. And I was reading the afterword by the author, and she said that she was really interested. Like, that was one of the things that led her to write this book, is that she was really interested in these, like, Americana spots that you would hit on a road trip around the nation and i thought well that's that's genius because i want to do that trip Mm -hmm. but i do not want to do that trip the way this trip was done because it's a little bit scary okay that's like the up until that point i'm like okay this sounds like it could be a fun kind of story maybe a little bit twisted too it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. I don't necessarily want to talk a lot about it until you read it, and then once you read it, we'll talk more about it. But that, okay, that, now you, you've got my attention. It's not paranormal scary. It's I, I just didn't think that's what you meant. Creepy. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think you meant any paranormal, but I figured you, you like there, there, there's somebody doing some stupid things going on. Correct. Here. That is correct. Okay. The last four star read I had this month was The Gray Seer by Kim Liggett. I actually purchased this book at Barnes and Noble last December. Like a twofer BOGO thing happened in. People had been talking about it. They said it's like Handmaid's Tale meets Lord of the Flies. And I would have to agree. I would also say it's kind of like the troop in some ways, but it's not gross like the troop in the way that the troop is gross. It is set in a a town, a time period, where the girls, when they turn 16, have to go for a year to a place to get rid of their magic. That's what people are telling them, get rid of their magic. It is never actually clear if the magic is actual magic or if the magic is just what they're calling 
the thing that women do in order to entice men, I don't know. I'm still kind of clueless about that because it's written both ways. It's not important to the book. So basically what happens is that during this time, the woman gets put on parade for one day. Then the men go and decide who they are going to stake their claim on. Then they are the women get veiled by their father to indicate that the man, a man has chosen them. And then the next morning they find out who has chosen them and then they leave for their grace year. So the women have no choice. They don't have any choice about who they end up with. They have no choice about what they do once they come back. If they don't get veiled, in fact, in this case, I think there's like 12 men and 33 women, they get shoved to a job working fields, factories, or what they call the outskirts, which means that they could be prostitutes, they could be gypsies. I don't, they don't really specify too much. You just know it's not a good thing. But you also hear horror stories about the place that they go for a year. Because as they're leaving, you see the people returning from their grace year and they're like emaciated and sunken and terrorized looking. So you don't really know what happens to them once they go. And there's all these rumors of like, you know, if you go outside the boundaries of the path to take to the place or the place itself, you will die. There are these things called poachers and they will basically skin you alive. So you have to stay in the boundaries, etc. But your whole deal is to like get rid of your magic for a year. And 33 girls in one spot might not necessarily be the safest place either. You know what I'm saying? All right. So. You you can't hear it. But I, I'm giving her all these kinds of looks like, nope. Nope. This is not good. Nope. Nope. But when you find out what really happens... You're kind of, kind of okay with it. Like I told Marshall after I read this book, I do not feel as depressed about this as I do about Handmaid's Tale at all. The ending was just so full of hope. And so, I don't know, like I, I felt like I was not depressed after reading this book. And what's really funny is we're, we're currently watching a men. It's on mm-hmm. Netflix. There is an episode we just watched, which was about women's rights and like the Equality Act. And I felt, I felt it in my soul having just read this book how true the the things were that we were watching on the show because that's exactly it. Women's reproductive rights and women's rights in general to do what they want. Even though this was kind of like a fictional dystopian type thing, it was very much applicable. So even if you're kind of like, I don't want to read this, it is kind of an important book, I think, in, in what happens and how things pan out even for people who might not necessarily be the most Mm kind-hearted it it, it really does showcase that okay so i have one five star that didn't make it into any of those other series and this was another one of those comics that i read with Corey for spinner rack kids and it's called huck all american and huck is the story of this guy who lives in the midwest and he is basically like superman Except he can't fly and he can't shoot lasers. Yay. Mm. What he can do, however, is he can just psychically know where a lost thing or person is. And he is a little bit on the spectrum. They, they keep on saying, well, he's slow or something. But because of how he was raised, he loves doing good things and making other people's lives better. That's his whole thing in life. Every single day, he breaks open his planner and says, well, what am I going to do today? And the whole town is keeping him a secret until a new person reveals him to the world and things start to kind of go along like that. This sounds like it's going to be a typical superhero Superman story, but this is just so filled with hope and good feelings and Hmm. good vibes because of who Huck is and... Because of that, I, I just walked away being like, ooh, after reading it. Oh, that's cute. Um, and it's not a hard read at all. In fact, it's something you might enjoy. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're in the home stretch. I have three five-star books, and I'm going to present them chronologically of when I read them. The first one is Cinderella is Dead by Kaylin Bayron. I think that you will say, Lainey, this would be your second Cinderella book this month. Well, it was actually my first, but yes, you're correct. I did read Mm -hmm. two Cinderella books this month. This book about Cinderella is also kind of like in a weird 
dystopian thing where you have to go to a ball in order to get married. And if you don't get married, then you're basically cast off and like thrown to the wolves. And unfortunately, Cinderella, I think, is a lesbian. Uh, kind of in this book I and I say unfortunately because obviously going to the ball and trying to find a male suitor when you're a lesbian it's not the best place to be in you know what I'm saying yeah it's not a good feels no but then he, there's some sinister stuff going on with King Prince dude so they go off on some kind of like quest to figure out how to defeat him when that Cinderella is dead why because Cinderella is dead the main character isn't Cinderella okay sounds legit yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I thank you for letting me know that up front. Okay. <laughs> Cinderella's dead. Okay, Cinderella's dead. Yeah. They basically live in a society where they are living the, like living under the tenets of the story of Cinderella, holding her on a pedestal. You know, the, the greatest love story, and now we're going to do the same thing for all of our women. Yay! But not yay. Yeah. Mm, not yay. That was a great, great one. I gave it five stars. My second one is Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren. I got this for review from NetGalley and I was excited because I love Christina Lauren. There's only two, maybe one, one or two books that I did not like of theirs. The Soulmate Equation is the story of an app and the app will, based on your DNA, give you people to date based on the percentage that you match with them. So if you're looking for some kind of like casual hookup, you can go for like a 10% match. But if you're looking for like your soulmate, you would go for an 80 or 90% match. But in this system, the matches 90% and above are very rare. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just basically on what you want to do. So it's not you're like one perfect person. It's really just like, what do you want to settle for in your life? So this woman who basically gets signed up to do this by her friend finds out that she is like a 98% match with the guy that she's kind of been seeing at the coffee shop who ends up being the creator. Well, one of the creators of this app. He's the one who basically figured out how to sequence the DNA in order to do it. So they, for purposes of press, decide that they're going to follow this through, even though neither one of them really want to date each other. They're going to follow this through for until the stock options start. So they're going to get really good publicity about the fact that, oh my gosh, that the guy who created this app actually found his 98% match. <laughs> um, and if in either anyone has read The One by John Mars or have plans to watch it on Netflix coming up this month in March, it is similar, but it is not similar. It is very uh, light and happy and romantic comedy. Okay. I think we've talked a little bit about this concept before, mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, I'm... I'm interested in these kinds of dating apps where it's the, the stories about dating apps where it's either gone wrong or it's given you a very anomalous result. Mm -hmm. But this one is it's more about, well, we got matched and we kind of have to do this for a little while. Let's do it and see what happens. Right. Which, I, you know, I, I can I can see that. My last book is my favorite book that I read this entire month. Mm -hmm. It is the Taylor Jenkins Reid book. Mm -hmm. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. If y'all have read this book, you're probably going, what took you so long? Because everyone loves this book, and I understand why everyone loves this book. It is also historical fiction, and this may be one of the books that will cause me to break out of my historical fiction hole. Because a lot of times I find historical fiction boring because it's like written in this big sweeping style. Well, this book is about Evelyn Hugo's life. She wants to write an autobiography, so she asks someone that writes for a local online paper to come and do an, like an interview with her for a newspaper article, but it's not a newspaper article. She tells her she wants her and only her to write her autobiography. So there are reasons why she chooses her, which you don't find out until the end of the book, but she takes you all the way through her life in Hollywood from, I believe the forties all the way up to the present time, why she married seven guys the role of, again, we're going to talk about women and how women were treated in Hollywood during the time, which I think we know a lot of when we, you know, we talk about Judy Garland yeah. um, and, and other people like that who are 
told they need to look a certain way or act a certain way. Or even um, have their voices sound a certain way, so now we're going to dump poison down your throat. Exactly. Th- that These are things that happen in her book, her life story. And you're told up front that Evelyn Hugo, she says she doesn't expect to be liked. She's not. She says she's not a good person. What's so interesting about this book is that even though she makes some really bad choices or choices that you might not necessarily think are the best choice or even a choice that's unselfish, you still are very sympathetic with this character to the point where I got to the end of this book and I was like literally crying because of Mm. everything that was happening in this book. I could not believe it. I, I, it blew my mind that this book caused me to react that way to it. And every time someone told me about this book, I was like, okay, well, that seems like an, an interesting book or whatever. No, blew my mind. So I am now totally on board the Taylor Jenkins Reid. Because that, that is something that you'll often t- see it in these books is that the, the writer even is somewhat prejudiced with their character and will try and paint them in a sympathetic way or an unsympathetic way. And so often we in real life, we're given really bad choices and we might make some some bad choices out of those. But mm-hmm. if you were to really see it from our own personal perspective, you'd be sympathetic. Right. I did a little research and in 2019 there was an article saying that this book was going to be made into like either a a series or a mini series on Freeform. So I was excited but yet also disappointed because Freeform. Yeah. I love Freeform, but I just didn't want this book to be too cheese. Yeah. You know? The impactfulness, I didn't want it to be lost in the story. And so if they do do it, I hope they don't lose that impactfulness that you have in discovering everything about this person's life. So yeah, that was my absolute favorite book. Surprisingly, my absolute favorite book this month, for sure. And that was my last book, number 17. Woot. Yeah. There there was a lot of books talked about here. What are you currently reading? Well, I have got myself quite the list. I am actually just about to start he started it Mm -hmm. uh, as audiobook i am also got my hands on namesake as an ebook i i I may at some point be getting into vicious slash vengeful but we'll see Mm -hmm. however even as we speak about this i already have two dnfs for this coming month yeah and but technically they're dnfs for february because it is still february so that means i have three dnfs in february that is correct yeah. Yeah. Because we are recording this two days till the end of February, I don't foresee myself really finishing any other books because I have other projects I'm doing this weekend. Mm-hmm. I am currently listening to A Court of Silver Flames. That book is like 15, 20 hours long. I don't know. It is very long. I've been listening to it this week and I'm just like, ah, I need to finish. I think I have like eight more hours to go. I I have also DNF'd quite a few books already, as you know. I just started reading Five Total Strangers, which is about five people who are on a plane and their layovers get canceled, so they decide to rent a car and travel to Pittsburgh altogether. But the girl, the main character, she thinks that the girl she sat next to on the plane is friends with the other three people. But turns out they're all strangers and they're mm-hmm. all hiding lies. It remi- I think it's going to remind me a lot of No Exit. Or maybe even the new Riley Sager Survive the Night. I don't know. Yeah. But that's what I'm reading currently right now physically, a physical book. The Court of Silver Flames is audio. And then I usually do one ebook, but I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. Um, and that is that is where I am right yeah. now as well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of books talked about here. What are you currently reading? Well, I have got myself quite the list. I am actually just about to start. He started it mm-hmm. uh, as an audiobook. I am also got my hands on Namesake as an ebook. I, I, I may at some point be getting into Vicious slash Vengeful, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. However, even as we speak about this, I already have two DNFs for this coming month. Yeah, and but technically they're DNFs for February because it is still February. So that means I have three DNFs in February? That is correct. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because we are recording this two days till the end of February, I don't foresee myself really finishing any other books because I have other projects I'm doing this weekend. Mm -hmm. I am currently listening to A Court of Silver Flames. That book is like 15, 20 hours long. I don't know. It is very long. I've been listening to it this week and I'm just like, "Ah, I need to finish. I think I have like eight more hours to go. I I have also DNF'd quite a few books already, as you know. I just started reading Five Total Strangers, which is about five people who are on a plane and their layovers get canceled, so they decide to rent a car and travel to Pittsburgh altogether. But the girl, the main character, she thinks that the girl she sat next to on the plane is friends with the other three people. But turns out they're all strangers and they're mm-hmm. all hiding lies. It remi- I think it's going to remind me a lot of No Exit. Or maybe even the new Riley Sager Survive the Night. I don't know. Yeah. But that's what I'm reading currently right now physically, a physical book. The Court of Silver Flames is audio. And then I usually do one ebook, but I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. Um, and that is that is where I am right yeah. now as well. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast. You can find Lainey on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. You can also find at Elated Geek on our Instagram. And you can also find Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter. If you want to go to a website, we have www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us to continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. And until next time, geek out.